anthropology is the study of man because it's got the ology root in it. So if you really wanted to translate mythology literally, it would be word word, which just sounds kind of silly. Um, but there's definitely something to consider is that there's definitely a distinction between mythology, folklore, and religion. Um, this distinction is difficult to make, and I don't think there's a hard and fast rule to it. But when I ran this panel at um, Anime Boston last week, a lot of people really wanted to talk about that. So kind of what I'm going to say is my basic um, des descriptions of these three is that mythology is a set of um, is a set of stories that relate to religions which are either uh, not worshipped anymore or are extremely uh, small subgroups. Uh, whereas folklore and legends are stories which may be based on some sort of truth and are related more to a cultural practice or a cultural group rather than a religious group. And then of course we have to separate that from religious stories themselves. We are going to look at a show which does use Buddhism, which of course is a very active religion. So I think we should separate that from mythology. So again, those are just my definitions. You guys might have your own things and I'd be interested to hear those. So uh, what I like to do for this uh, presentation is I like to show a generic picture of the anime and have you guys yell it out and see how many people know it. So let's get started. Say say uh. Yay! my favorite show. I love Saint Seiya. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Saint Seiya is, um, it's a great example of a show that uses mythology and both hits and mits misses the mark in terms of imagery. Um, the story is that there's these uh, knights who fight for Athena against Hades, basically, and it's very flashy and very 80s, and Athena has purple hair in it, and it's very weird. But the reason I like to start with it is because it's both extremely accurate and extremely not accurate in regards to its use of mythology. So the setting of Saint Seiya is a place called the Sanctuary, which, while it's not a mythological setting, it does help one visualize the story within a Greek tradition because it's basically an exact replica of the Athenian Acropolis, complete with a temple of Athena at the top and a theater at the bottom. And this is a picture of the Athenian Acropolis. You can see the uh, hemispherical theater at the bottom and the wonderful temple to Athena at the top. This temple would have had a very large statue in it, but that statue has now been lost. Um, so we already are in while it's not a mythological setting, definitely putting ourselves in the Greek tradition to begin with. So let's look at a couple of the characters. So this is Athena. So obviously the purple hair is a little distracting and the ridiculous gold-winged anime armor might seem a little tasteless, but I'd like to argue that Athena is still recognizable as the goddess Athena. So on the right, I've got an image of the, um, is it the right for you guys? Uh, okay, yeah. uh, you, you guys know which one's the anime, which one's the statue. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, we're gonna assume that right now. Um, so that's an image of a Roman marble replica of the Athena Parthenos, which is the statue I mentioned that would have been in the Temple of Athena. And you can see that Athena's holding uh, Nike, who is the goddess of victory, in her hand. And she also has a shield, which is the Aegis. And, Aegis, and you can see there's like the little head of Medusa on the side of it. That's how you know it's the Aegis. Um, so these are two of the biggest... Um, like representative things that show that you're looking at Athena in comparison to, you know, another goddess. And she has these things in her personification in Saint Seiya. So you can see she has the shield. It doesn't have the Medusa on it, but it is called the Aegis in the story. And she has a staff. And the staff is really cool because um, the staff actually turns into a little statue of Nike. So that is the Nike staff. So we do see that the main images that identify a statue of Athena to us do show up in the story. And this continues um, with other characters as well who maybe aren't as main characters in the story. So these are the um, four dream gods who show up in Saint Seiya the Lost Canvas, which is my favorite Saint Seiya show. And um, they are in Hesiod's Theogony, that's the uh, 7th century BC text where these uh, figures first show up. They are called the children of sleep. And in Saint Seiya, these are kind of like the minions of Hypnos, the, the god of sleep, who is one of the villains of the story. And one of their defining traits is in Hesiod's Theogony, they are called dark winged. That is their main trait. They are always called dark winged. And as you can see, they have black wings. Um, so I think that's a very interesting um, use of imagery because, you know, it's, it's, these gods don't show up very often in Greek mythology, but the one indicator that they do have in myths is used in the imagery here. Um, so this also 
uh, then leads on to Hypnos and Thanatos, who are two of the villains in uh, more than one Saint Seiya story, but they do show up pretty prominently in The Lost Canvas. Um, as you can see, these gods are also winged. Saint Seiya does have a whole thing about winged gods. For people standing in the back, there are a number of seats. Uh, there's two in the front row on this side, two in the front row on this side, and a number spread throughout. Try not to block the door, because we might be a fire hazard and that would be bad. Uh, thank you. Um, so here, this is how the gods are portrayed uh, within the story. And then this is an attic uh, red figure vase painting from the fifth century BC. And here, this is showing the death of Sarpedon from the Iliad, and the bodies being carried away by two winged gods. And these gods are labeled on the vase, though it, the writing is backwards and in Greek, so like, have fun trying to read it. They are labeled as Hypnos and Thanatos, and then you've got Hermes in the back, like, hey guys, can I help out? Like, no Hermes, you can leave. Um, but but here, here again, one of the defining traits of Hypnos and Thanatos is that they have wings, and that is something that we also see within um, Saint Seiya. So what's really cool is that while the characters are still very much in the style of the anime, and it's an 80s anime so it's ridiculous, they're still recognizable as gods from Greek mythology because of their attributes. So again, here's another one. This is Poseidon from the anime. Well, he has his trident. Poseidon is pretty recognizable when he's got his trident. It's the only thing that makes you tell a statue of Zeus and Poseidon apart when you're looking at art history. So that's... that's it's interesting that while those are kind of, they might seem, if you know mythology, they might seem to be very obvious indicators. It's still trying to use that within the story. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And again, it's not just with the characters, but also in, with imagery in general. So the main character of Saint Seiya, for those of you who don't know, is the Pegasus Saint. And literally, whenever the Pegasus Saint fights someone, and punches them in the face, a giant picture of a Pegasus appears behind him, letting you know, hey guys, this is the Pegasus saint. And of course, the Pegasus is a figure from Greek mythology. On the um, other side of the screen, I have um, the remnants of a 6th century BCE temple from ancient Greece, and it is um, the birth of Pegasus and his um, human brother that no one cares about from Medusa's cut head. Unfortunately, Pegasus doesn't remain, but you can see where they've outlined where Pegasus would have been. So not only is it, it is a mythological figure, not only is it the basis of the main character's name, but it also appears frequently enough for you to remember that, hey, we are working in the Greek tradition. And since this anime is about fighting people and the Pegasus shows up whenever the main character tries to use his attack, you know, it's pretty frequently. Um, so I think, I would argue that in this case, Saint Seiya is a very good example of a show which has mythology within its basic plotline, but also really works hard to make sure that you don't forget that it's there. It uses it in the imagery as well as the plot, as well as the characters, and I think it's a good example of something which uses it consistently and cohesively. So I, I can talk about the Greek tradition for ages, and I'm not going to, because that's probably not why you're here. Um, so let's look at another anime. Yeah. All right, you've got to say the name, not scream happily. <laughs> yeah, so um, what I'm going to say applies to the Fate universe in general, but I am specifically going to talk about Fate Zero because A, it's my favorite and I'm biased, and B, there's just a lot to talk about in the Fate universe. So for those of you who have no idea what Fate Zero is and why people are happy about it, um, short summary, Holy Grail appears every 60 years, seven mages fight each other to the death with their summoned seven heroic spirits, and it's awesome and shenanigans happen. Um, it's really the only thing I could say. The one stipulation about having fate in this presentation is that of course it combines historical as well as mythological persona, so keep that in mind. But the plot is very much based in the mythological tradition and here we get into folklore a little, so think about what I said with definitions. So the Holy Grail is the central point of most fate series. I know the shenanigans, but um, it, the Holy Grail appears in, uh, it first appears in 12th century romance texts. Um, one of the, the, those examples is Perceval les Galois. And these stories are based in the Arthurian legend. So these are the Arthurian romances, which everyone knows and loves. Um, but this is the first att attestation, the first textual attestation of the Holy Grail in Western literature, basically. Um, 
So what's cool about the fact that the Holy Grail is a central point is, of course, this is our main character of Fate Zero, who is Saber, who is Arthur. And, you know, Arthur is kind of a big deal in Arthurian legends. That's <laughs> why it's called Arthurian legends. Um, so here we have um, a main plot device, the Holy Grail, which um, is being used in its mythological folkloric context, but also then ties into the mythological and folkloric context of the main character. And Saber appears in like almost every Fate series, I'm pretty sure. So that's kind of a very cohesive use of a plot device. So that's really interesting. Um, of course, we can say some things about um, Saber. Uh, obviously she's an amazing character and she's recognizable because she has the Excalibur which uh, we don't know what Excalibur would look like I guess you can look at manuscripts but then just going to show you what monks thought it looked like so we can't I can't really show you a picture and say like oh it looks like you know 13th century manuscripts but you know it's a very shiny sword for us it's very recognizable that it would be Excalibur of course the main difference with fate is that Arthur is a woman um, which is pretty big deviation from 12th century French Arthurian romance manuscripts, which don't say that. But I wonder if that really doesn't actually take away from the fact that we're still in a um, mythological uh, tradition. I wonder if it adds to it or if it doesn't do anything at all. I'd be interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. And it's not just Saber. A lot of the characters are done very well. We're going to talk about the best character of Fate Zero, everyone. Alexander the Great. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, ooh, lost my place. So Alexander the Great was a real person, probably, um, but the events surrounding his life are very much up to opinion. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with texts about Alexander the Great's life, you'll know that they are not written at the time he was alive, are uh, basically word of mouth and are extremely, extremely over-glorified. So in this case, we could consider um, the stories about Alexander the Great to be folklore rather than actual you know, historical facts. And all the texts are fragmentary, we don't even have most of them. But what's great about the character of Alexander the Great in Fate Zero is that all of his abilities are actually just taken straight out of the text about Alexander the Great's life. So I'm going to talk about a couple of them. So in this picture, um, you can see um, Ryder and Waver are on the Gordius's wheel. So the Gordius's wheel is this big chariot pulled by cows, and um, so which is super cool because the myth of Gordius's uh, well, Gordius's wheel is based on a myth of Gordius's knot, which is in Phrygia, which is part of modern day Turkey. Um, and basically, the Phrygians were up, were in uproar because they didn't have a king, and the oracle was like, okay, the next person who drives an ox cart into your city he's gonna be king. And the Phrygians were like, this makes sense. That's a great idea. So anyway, this guy Gordius comes along, he's driving his ox cart and everyone's like, you're the king, you're the king. And he's like, um, okay, this sounds great. And so the ox cart gets dedicated as an important monument and is just left in the middle of the road in the city. I don't know who came up with street planning in Phrygia, but really guys. Um, so when, when Alexander the Great crosses the Hellespont from Macedonia into Turkey, hell bent on, you know, taking down Darius and killing the Persians, he decides to undo the knot on Gordius's cart, and he fails and just cuts it in half instead. Um, and then if you read the text, apparently there's a thunderstorm, Zeus is like, hey, great, you did it, and that's the prophecy that's the reason he will be the next ruler of the East, okay, whatever. But the myth is pretty sound in that in Fate Zero he has a giant cart which is called Gordius's Wheel. So I think that's super cool. And that's not the only thing either. So um, Gordius's Wheel is, as I said, driven by two cows. And when these cows show up and the, the chariot is summoned, there's lots of lightning everywhere. And what's really great about this is that I mentioned Phrygia earlier, right? Phrygia is in Anatolia, modern day Turkey. Uh, the main culture of the ancient world that lived in Turkey were called the Hittites, and the Hittites had a god called Teshub, who you can see on this side of the screen, and Teshub is the storm god, and he is always, always portrayed in his little chariot with his little cows, and since he's the storm god, he's the god of lightning, and he's always got his little lightning rod, and these cows actually are called uh, Shuri and Huri, and they represent the day and the night, so not only do we have a story, and not only do we have Gordius's Wheel, which is based on a story in which Alexander the Great was featured, but this also goes back even further imagery-wise into the culture that preceded the Phrygians, which I think is really, really cool. And I don't know about you guys, maybe you guys think it's cool too, but I think it's cool. And this this then proceeds into the other characters as well. For instance, this is not Fate Zero, but his his Heracles or Hercules or whatever you want to call him. And he's very recognizable as Heracles because he's got a big club. 
Like that's <laughs> that's the only thing <laughs> that will tell you that it's Hercules. And here's um here's a statue of the Farnese Hercules, and you can see he's leaning on his cloak, which is covering his club. And that's really like if you see a picture of a naked dude with a club, it's probably Hercules. So we we get that. We get that, for instance. And Fate Zero, it isn't all good. For instance, we have um this guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I love Gilgamesh, he's a terrible character. Um, so here things get a little funky. So unfortunately Gilgamesh is a character in the show. And I don't know about you guys, but he is the whitest looking Mesopotamian I have <laughs> ever seen. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Epic of Gilgamesh is like possibly the first story from Western culture, and it comes from ancient Mesopotamia, which let me tell you, people in ancient Mesopotamia were not white, because it's the Near East. Um, but like, it's not like anime does a good job at getting races right to begin with. Uh, what upsets me so much about this character is that Gilgamesh's noble phantasms are really accurate to Babylonian mythology, and it's super annoying. So um, this, is, this is his main attack. It's called the Gates of Babylon, which is a stupid word because Babylon comes from two Sumerian words, Babu and Ilu. And Babu and Ilu literally means the gates of God. So his attack is literally the gates of the gates of God. Um, <laughs> like, okay, but it's still referencing Babylon, which was the main culture that used the Epic of Gilgamesh as their, you know, quintessential literature. And then we also have two other um, weapons that uh, Gilgamesh has. In, in Fate Zero slash Fate Tonight, he's got um, a blade called Enlil Ea, and in Fate uh, Prototype, he's got a bow called Enki, who are the two main gods of the Sumerian pantheon, which I personally think it's super cool. Um, and it just annoys me because the noble phantasm is ridiculously flashy and results in nothing but overkill, but the naming is awesome. Um, so Fate Zero, I think, does a really good job with representation, um, but we do have issues of character design. Arthur is a woman, Gilgamesh is white. Um, but uh, then we have to consider that there's actually, while we have images of Arthur, there are actually no images of the Epic of Gilgamesh from ancient Mesopotamia. Um, despite this, there is one relief sculpture now at the Louvre, which always gets associated as being Gilgamesh, but it's not. Scholars don't say it is, the Louvre doesn't say it is, no one says it is. Um, the problem with this is that there are a plethora of heroes in Mesopotamian cultures that we just don't know about because the text don't survive. We're talking 5,000 years ago these things were written down. Um, so obviously we're not going to have everything. Um, but because everyone knows the Epic of Gilgamesh as the only Babylonian story we have, everyone's like, oh yeah, it's Gilgamesh. Um, but then, and so in the end of Fate Zero, in the ending song, there's all these pictures of like the characters back when they were in the past, and this is the one of Gilgamesh. And obviously it's referencing this statue of not Gilgamesh from the Louvre. Um, but in that, but the thing is with the statue is even though it's not Gilgamesh, everyone thinks it is, uh, in popular culture, it, it is basically. So I wonder if, since it's an incorrect description, if it changes um, the mythological value of it. And I don't really know the answer to that, so I'd be curious as to what you guys say. All right, so let's get away from the Western tradition for a bit and look at... <laughs> oh, God! It's Hazuki no Reitetsu, and if you have not watched the show, it's 13 episodes long. Please go watch it. It's on Crunchyroll. Um, Hazuki no Reitetsu is great. It is a slice of life anime about a guy who works in the Buddhist underworld, and it's beautiful. Uh, so Hazuki, as you can see, is this guy with the club. Not Hercules, just because he's got a club, guys. Don't, don't get confused. Um, so Hazuki no Reitetsu is great. The basic premise is that this guy like works in the Buddhist underworld, and he's got to run errands and stuff for the king of hell, and so it takes you around all of the different underworlds, but it's very accurate to the Buddhist system of beliefs. So there's eight cold hells and eight hot hells, as it tells you in the very happy opening song. And uh, here we have Shiro, a little dog who works in the hell of people who are cruel to animals by ripping them to pieces. Um, so you know, it's good stuff. So uh, setting-wise, again, we find a story that is extremely accurate in its um, story setting, but also in its imagery setting. And this guy is the king of hell. This is a traditional picture of the Buddhist king of hell and then how he appears in the anime. Little fatter, which is actually something he mentions. Uh, there's an episode where they actually talk about what they look like in um, artistic representations in the King of Hell's like, yeah, I used to be slimmer. And so I think that's a really interesting dialogue with the actual tradition. And the same is true for our dear friend Huzuki. So um, and in the traditional uh, rendering of the underworld up here, you can see the King of Hell's got this like guy standing next to him. 
And um, there's an episode in the anime where someone's like, well, Hozuki, how come you're not in any of these pictures? And he takes out a bunch of traditional drawings, points to this guy standing next to the King of Hell, and is like, yeah, that's me. Like, I know it doesn't look like me, but it is me. And so in that case, we've got this show that actually brings up the fact that character-wise, they don't actually all necessarily look like they do in the actual artistry, but they use the actual artistry in the story to have a dialogue about that. And I, I think that's funny and clever and also really, really cool. And this uh, relates to the other characters as well. So um, in Hosoki no Ritetsu, there's the Buddhist underworld, and then there's the European underworld. Satan comes to visit for a day. It's really funny. Um, but there's also Shangri-La, which, is a, a, which it comes from, which is the Buddhist afterlife. And um, the first text we get of this is um, first century AD. And this comes into Western culture in 20th century literature. So we're well grounded in that respect. Um, and this world also has its own characters. So here we have Hakutaku. He is a celestial beast and he lives in Shangri-La. And in the anime, he's the medicine dude, but not like, not like a shady medicine dude, like a drug dealer, like an actual medicine dude. like. The, no, no connotations there. And what's great about this character is um, that there's a whole episode where he actually tells the original myth of the celestial Hakutaku beast and the Yellow Emperor as if it were his memory. So the legend, for those of you who don't know, is that um, the Yellow Emperor, who supposedly ruled in like the uh, third millennium BCE in China, uh, was performing an imperial tour, and he climbed the mountains and found this Hakutaku beast who's on the screen. And basically the beast was like, yeah, there's 11,000 different kinds of beasts in the world. And the emperor was like, I'm gonna catch them all. And um, basically he, he like recorded everything he knew about um, the beast in his little Pokedex, I'm kidding. Um, and, but it was lost long ago and no copies survived. So what we have is this legend about him going to meet a magical beast with like weird amounts of eyes on a mountain. Um, and there's also, but what's really cool about this is that there's the original story from China and then there's also regional differentiations of it in Japan, which is that this monster um, was actually related to plague and medicine. So here we can see that there's multiple versions of this character who are both being embodied in the uh, version in the anime. So I don't know, I think that's cool. Maybe you guys don't. So next mythology I'm gonna talk about. So whenever I run this panel, I feel like I always wanna talk about Egyptian mythology, but I always end up talking about Yu-Gi-Oh! Because it's the only one I can think of. But I found, I found another one, guys. I found, I found something else. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> kidding, kidding. I'm, I'm kidding, but that would be funny. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, Great Priest Imhotep, which I think is a fairly new manga, actually. Do any of you guys know it? Somewhat, somewhat. It's only like 30 chapters out, and I love it. It's so good. So basically the plot line is there's these creatures called Makai who are kind of like possessing people and running wild, and this like ancient Egyptian organization of magicians, like, okay, that's fine, um, decide to resurrect Imhotep, who's the person who made these monsters in the first place, to get rid of them. What's great about Great Priest Imhotep is that unlike gods of Egypt, the Egyptian characters are not white. Hey! <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, so what's really cool about Great Priest Imhotep is um, imagery-wise and plot-wise, it is extremely in keeping with the Egyptian mythological tradition. So in Egyptian mythology, there is a concept, in Egyptian religion, actually, I should say, there is a concept called syncretism, which is basically that when the Egyptians were creating their religion, they had um, multiple gods that were the same god, but of a different place. So you had like Horus of the air, Horus of the sun, Horus of this one town in the middle of the desert, and by the Middle Kingdom, these versions of Horuses all got merged into one god, Horus, the falcon dude, the guy we all know and love, kind of, maybe. Um, but syncretism is these multiple versions of the same god that appear, and you can worship them in different places. So it's really cool about Great Priest Imhotep as a manga is that the Makai, who are the demons that Imhotep's trying to defeat, are actually subversions of the Egyptian gods. So in the first chapter, he fights a Sekhmet Makai. In the second chapter, there's another Makai, like a Horus Makai, something like that. So they're all these different duplications of 
a deity, and that's really, really tying in with the concept of syncretism, which was massive in Egyptian religion. This was one of the most important concepts in their mythological tradition, was that you had multiple versions of the same god. And to see that come through in a manga, for me, I was, I was over the moon, I was like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. And on top of that, within the story, there's also multiple versions of the gods themselves. So there are multiple Anubises, even though they're also Anubis Makai, there are multiple Anubises of the god as well. So that's really cool. So I feel like a lot of what I've said is um, stories where we see a good use of mythology. Well, I think it's a good use of mythology. You guys might argue with me, and if you do, I'd love to hear your arguments. So let's look at some anime where maybe it doesn't work as well. So... Is someone going to yell it out? Yeah, I'm just going to call it Damachi because I can't be bothered to say that whole phrase. So, um, yeah, is it wrong to pick up girls in dungeons? So the plot line of this anime is that um, gods come down to earth to live with people and they form like these families and they, they can like grant power to humans who fight for them in this dungeon, blah, blah, blah. The main character is the only member of the Hestia family. Hestia is the little one in the middle, like, yeah, let's go. Um, so, like Fate Zero, there's a lot of um, gender switching in um, Damachi, which is totally fine. I would argue that um, gender switching is not a problem for Greek mythology, well, for mythology in general, since gods are changing genders all the time. Um, but I find that Damachi, in comparison to the anime we've looked at, has a lot less representation in it for actually like indicating that it is a god. Um, which is sad because like Fate Zero and Saint Seiya, the creators definitely seem to have their mythology down. So for instance, um, it's a super big deal that Hestia has a crush on the main character because she, Athena, and Artemis are all virgin goddesses. So everyone's like, this, you're not allowed to do this. You're literally not allowed to do this. going against every single tradition that involves Hestia ever. And so that's, that's good. That's a really good mythological point. But aside from that, there's nothing really to indicate that that goddess is Hestia. So here we have um, Hephaestus, Freya and Hestia, and um, Hephaestus is the one in red, and she's shown with an eye patch, which I guess is meant to like represent her disability. So for those of you who don't know, Hephaestus got thrown off of Mount Olympus and was horribly disfigured and a cripple for the rest of his life. But I guess making Hephaestus just have an eye patch makes sense. Um, I don't think it makes sense, but there we are. Um, but at least she is the god of metalworking in the story. So on one hand, she does have her signature trait represented, but on the other hand, imagery-wise, in, in regards to what her character looks like, I don't think it does justice to the figure of Hephaestus. And um, I think the same is true for, for Freya. So Freya's on the other side here. Um, so Freya in the story has like very weird love powers. It's, it's, it's creepy. I don't know what's going on there. But there's no imagery to say, ah yes, this is Freya. She doesn't have a particularly Norse looking outfit on. Like Freya's also also like a, a spring goddess, but her main outfit doesn't really have much to indicate. It's black, I'm I read the manga, so I don't know, I don't know why, um, but I'm pretty sure it's a dark color. Um, so here, I think we have the issue that the imagery doesn't really, um, it's not cohesive with the mythology used in the story. And I wonder if, for me at least, the use of mythology in Danmachi um, doesn't, isn't done justice because there is a disconnect between the use of it in the plot and the use of it imagery-wise. Um, so now, now let's look at a, a silly one. Second Boy! Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so so um, for those of you who haven't watched Seco Boys, it is a story about a girl who becomes the manager for an idol group. The idol group consists of four marble busts. Um, <laughs> it's really funny. The episodes are like seven minutes long each. Once you guys are done watching Hazuki no Ritetsu, I would definitely give it a go because it's, it's pretty hysterical. I love it and I don't normally like this kind of um, anime. So um, with this show, there is no mythology related to the plot in the slightest. There's absolutely nothing. Yet the imagery, aka the four marble busts, are actually extremely accurate to our, history, our, our history. So. Um, the, yeah, right, so the, um, the Ares, uh, which is on the side closest to me, is a Roman copy of a Greek bust by the uh, famous um, sculptor Alcmenes, um, but it's Ares, not Mars, so that's a fun fact. Um, then we have St. George, uh, who's the next one over, who is a statue made by Donatello. 
And then uh, the Medici statue, which is the one over from that, is made by Michelangelo. And the Hermes is a famous Roman copy of a Greek bust, but there's no, we don't know who, who made it. So as you can see, they literally just took the actual marble portraits and just put them into the anime. So here, the mythology is very accurate because it's just a copy of it, but there's no relationship to the plot. Again, there's a, there's a disconnect between the plot and the imagery. So even though, and, and what's great is that so the busts talk, that's why they're idols, just in case anyone's thinking it's literally just four portrait busts, they're magic portrait busts. And um, they, they speak as if the, the, who they represent is actually like the story of the character. So St. George is like, yeah, this one time I fought a dragon, blah, blah, blah. And so in there, how the characters act is extremely accurate, but there's no actual bearing on it to the plot in the slightest. Um, so I wonder then, I mean, I love Seco Boys, but I wonder then if it is successful as an anime which uses mythology, because I think that's something that I've really thought about why I've been doing these panels for the past three years, is that there's a lot of anime which has mythology somewhere in it. Either a character is called Loki, because there's always an anime with a character called Loki for no good reason, or the, myth, or the, the plot kind of uses some sort of mythology, but if the imagery and the mythology and the plot isn't there, can it be called a successful use? Even if it's a good show, it can still be unsuccessful in its use of something. So that's that's mainly what I wanted to talk about. Um, so now, really, I'd like to kind of hear what you guys have to say. Like, if you guys have any examples, if you guys have any comments, I'd really like to get a discussion going, because that's my favorite part of this. So um, you guys are going to have to speak up. I am partially deaf. Yes? Um, I came late. Did you touch on Ruby? The show Ruby Ruby? Does it count as an anime? <laughs> that, that is uh, an anime. Anime, anime is a very broad term. Okay, I've I've never counted it, so I didn't touch on it. But, but like that's why. So why would why would you say what's the mythology in that? I'm curious. Um, well, you have the main team, which is fairy tales. Um, uh, Red Riding Hood is Ruby. Uh, you have Snow White is Wise. You have Beauty, Beauty and the Beast is Blake. You have um, Goldilocks for Yang. Um, Team Juniper is historical gender event figures. Um, Jean Marc is yeah. and so on and so forth. And there's other mythical things. There's Ozpin, which is the Wizard of Oz. Things so, like that. would you count that as mythology though? Because so Wizard of Oz obviously yeah, is, is a story, um, but I. Is a, is a sacred narrative. It but would a, it count it as a, folklore? It's contemporary folklore, but it's still folklore. Yeah, it's folklore. So, um. It, it's super interesting. I think you're right in mentioning that it is folklore. I've never considered doing it for the panel before, but it's definitely something to consider. I think the main thing I, I would mention about that point is that um, there definitely is a differentiation between mythology and folklore, and we need to be very careful about um, talking about that line. And what I'd be more curious in is that, okay, so um, I, have, I have seen a bit of Ruby. So, um, ooh, I hit the microphone. So the, it's definitely that, that, that those stories, those folklore, legends work within the characters themselves, but do those individual stories then add anything to the main narrative of Ruby is what I'd be more curious and wondering, and maybe that's something you can think about while I take other questions. I know there were some people hanging out on this side. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, just going back to Saint Seiya. Going back to Saint Seiya, uh, I found it interesting that, you know, you have Benitos there, he looks like a very typically pretty anime man. Sorry, I hate Benitos. <laughs> <laughs> I have a strong dislike to Benitos, so uh, it's a matter of opinion. But please continue, I was being stupid. Well, um, it's just kind of interesting because from what I remember of studying uh, some of the Greek mythology is he starts out being portrayed as bearded and scary, but then slowly evolves into a much more prime of his oh, life, youthful, beautiful Greek. Yeah, what you're what you're referring to there is so like um, early on, obviously um, Thanatos is the brother of Hypnos and the son of Nyx, yeah. and so um, in like fifth century Attic Greek figure, you are going to get like a bearded Thanatos and a bearded Hypnos. Um, in fourth century, this tradition comes out of totally left field that Thanatos and Eros are twins, and obviously Eros. Oh my God, we're going to get into Platonic dialogue here, and I'm going to cry. But Eros 
has to be beautiful because love is beautiful and so if love and death are twins then death also has to be beautiful so yes it does depend on what period of greek history or greek yeah greek thought i guess you're looking at but that is something that comes in in the fourth century with platonic dialogue which is super interesting but I, the other thing about saint seiya though is there's no ugly characters in saint seiya like they're like everyone's beautiful everyone and if, if they're ugly they're, they're there for like two seconds and then they die because that's that's literally how saint seiya works <laughs> let's be honest here but yeah that's a really good point we also have to consider that myths change so maybe um you know when you study when you look at how a mythology is used in an anime maybe you have to look for like an obscure use of the mythology maybe rather than like the mainstream what you're going to read in like a myths and legends but but that's a super good point yeah um there were yes there was you and then and then our mabel over there so she wanted one of the points you mentioned earlier about with the fate series that if a uh, interpretation the uh, gender benefit that changes but i'd like to but also i was wondering your opinion the works of paradise lost and um dante's divine trinity both are treated at least to modern day people as basically offshoots of the religious text even though very little of it is putting over so Maybe just the fact that it's interpreted, just because the mythology is over or it's concrete, doesn't it change over time and that change also becomes concrete just as much as the origin? No, that's, I mean, that's a fantastic point, and I think that's something we really need to consider is that just because an interpretation is incorrect to what the main body of text says doesn't mean that it's wrong. So just because it's not factually exactly what we see in Homer, Hesiod, whatever you want does it mean that it's incorrect and that's why i really have no issues gender bending because i think you know if you're going to use mythology yeah interpret it how you want and make something new of it but then you know um so this is probably a terrible example but it's the only one i could think of um if you look at, at tolkien you look at tolkien's silmarillion obviously the silmarillion is basically just taking greco-roman norse and judeo-christian traditions and just mushing it all together and changing the names and it's done fantastically i love the silmarillion but at that point you know everyone said tolkien created his own mythology it's fantastic of course it's not created everything's taken from something else but it was so interpreted to the point where it did seem to be like an original piece of work and so then at that point you really have to think about is it using mythology in its central core of the story or is it using mythology in order to create its own um words fail me to create its own um world building maybe i think is the right phrase and i think it's a super interesting point to bring up you know where does interpretation just get silly or is there really no silly interpretation because at the end of the day you're doing something original with what you want to do so that's, that's a really good point to consider thank you um yeah I was gonna say that that's really cool and I'll definitely consider that next time I, I think about running this panel. I think it's still it would still be important to look at, you know, how those individual things then play into the larger story. It's like it's like for fate for instance. So everyone in fate has their own mythology and it's it's done very well. Well most most of the time it's done very well. But then we need to think about how that ties into the original plot. So it's cool that, you know, the mythology for Saber is the mythology for the main plot line, the Holy Grail. And so it would be interesting then to look at all the different mythologies, folklores which are brought up in Ruby and see how it relates to the actual plot and the actual world building. But thank you for mentioning that. But you had a question. Uh, I wanted to know if you saw the show Kami Dami no I actually talked about coming going us when I read this panel last year. I love it. It's so good. Um so yeah, coming going us is a bit like fate and it's one of those things where it brings in a lot of different mythologies. Um with coming going us it's weird because obviously the 
the for the I'm going to talk about the anime. I haven't played the game. In the anime, you know, the main problem they have to deal with is Tree Man, Tree Man Balder, um, which is. I, which is an interesting interpretation of Baldur's powers in Norse mythology. So in that case, I would say it's successful in that the central plot does revolve around mythology, which is used in an interpretive but successful manner, while all the other characters are still like remotely within character for the different respective mythologies they come from. Does everyone know Kamigami no Asobi? Okay, so it's basically this, okay, I'm, oh, forgive me if I get this wrong, it's been a while since I watched it. Um, this girl has to like go to this magical high school kind of thing with these gods and she has to like help them be friends or something or Zeus is gonna mess everything up as per usual. Um, but basically there's a bunch of gods in it um, and it's kind of high schoolish. But um, yeah, I think Coming on Asabi is definitely an interesting case. I would put it in the same category as like Fate, Dan Machi, Ruby, in which it's a lot of things mushed together, and then you have to look at how those things are used successfully. But yeah, I love Coming on Asabi. It's terrible. I love it. Yes. So cool. Uh, I have a with that. Just put no. There are key stories about them where they do that themselves. Yeah. The most famous probably being Loki turning into a female horse and then giving birth. <laughs> Little sleep there. <laughs> but I wanted to ask if you've come across anything, because there's obviously a lot of Greek and Eastern religion, Roman represented. Have you found anything focusing more in the Nordic and German folklore religions that's represented well? Yes and no. Okay, the first thing I can think of that comes to mind is Saint Seiya Asgard arc. Hey, um, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, in Saint Seiya, they fight, um, they fight in Asgard. Um, the main villain of Soul of Gold is Loki. Um, in, the As in the Asgard arc, they fight the, um, the other, the Asgardian saints. And um, I find that with things that have Norse mythology in them, like Kamigame no Asobi, like Dan Machi, like Saint Seiya Asgard Ark and Soul of Gold, is that they're really, really good about naming conventions and getting the setting right. You know, everyone likes to make like a Norse setting for something, but um, in regards to like use of gods, I don't think I've really ever come across something that I've really enjoyed wise. I can see someone's got a hand. Are you gonna, are you gonna suggest something? You gonna suggest a show for us? Nope. Okay. So if anyone has a show that they think uses North mythology well, I'd be super interested to hear it. Yeah, Sarah. Okay. I haven't seen all of it, but I know there is mythical detective Loki Ragnarok. I hate that. Oh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Sorry. That was really strong. That was really strong. I don't hate. I don't hate the show. Its use of mythology is very inaccurate and just not relevant to the plot. So in regards to a, a show which uses Norse mythology in relation to the plot and yet also has good imagery, I don't know of one. But um, there are a lot of things that you can look at which have either like good representation of the gods or and then don't have the imagery or have like good world building and don't have good representation of the gods. So I haven't found a series which really balances everything perfectly. But if any of you guys have suggestions, I would love to hear them and other people would love to hear them too. But that's, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, They are human as a mythological character, but human psyche is not a thing, except it's a story. Yeah. It's like a whole story. Uh, I also feel that for the Norse mythology, if they're right, like, this, everything we know from like one guy, story, sorry, 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 Norse and Mesopotamian mythology, it's really hard to get hold of the texts themselves. Like, if Mesopotamian mythology, if you want to read anything that isn't the epic of Gilgamesh, like, good luck finding it translated. Um, and I think the same is true for Norse myth. It's just that a lot of what we have comes from the same author, but it's not all from one author. There are, there are multiple manuscripts floating around. The Poetic Edda is the main one.